everyone says my dog can't bite, but mm. every single dog can bite if put in the right environment and situation. Right. So they don't want to pass dogs that don't enjoy it. That's not fair to a, fair to a dog to force mm -hmm. them to do something they don't enjoy. Um, so it makes it safe for both human and dog. So the particular um, need that you were solving or your organization was solving was not only to care about the individuals that these pets were visiting, but also to care about the pets. Exactly. Canine Assisted Therapy, established in 2009, is a 501c3 organization which serves over 300,000 people in the South Florida community annually through certified pet therapy activities. Currently, 120 certified teams provide animal-assisted therapy to over 100 facilities, organizations, and schools. Now, here's your host for the Entrepreneurial Vibration Show, Sandy Viteri. Cat is canine assisted therapy, and this is dear to my heart, and I love canine assisted therapy. I met you and Joanne about two and a half years ago, mm -hmm. um, and this it was, one day I basically decided that I wanted to have Chewy, my golden retriever, to become a therapy dog. And I know that this program is dedicated to entrepreneurs, uh, not necessarily to nonprofit organizations, but I thought that because forming a nonprofit organization is very, very similar mm -hmm. to actually being an entrepreneur. It was Joanne and Deborah, and they saw an unmet need in the community um, for safe and effective and high quality pet therapy. So they formed canine assisted therapy with two dogs which was basically each of their dogs were already therapy dogs with another organization. Okay. So they broke away, they formed their own organization. They mainly went to nursing homes. This was um, almost 10 years ago, and pet therapy wasn't as mainstream as it is today. Mm -hmm. um, so they had to knock on a lot of doors and convince a lot of, of different facilities to try pet therapy, to see what it could do. And over the last nine, nine and a half years, the organization has grown from two dogs that started it um, to over 100. So now it's a little more mainstream and we have done some specialization of our program. So not, we still do the nursing homes, the visits to the hospitals, um, but we also have uh, developed some programs very specific to uh, children with special needs, um, veterans with PTSD. Um, we also are in the Broward County Courthouse we just had our five-year anniversary of being the um, therapy dog organization that started the program in the Broward County Dependency uh, Courts. And we also do um, some literacy with first and second grade students who mm -hmm. are falling behind in, in reading. Okay. So we have lots of different programs and it's evolved, you know, it didn't start that way. It's just, it's evolved over the years to meet the need of the community. I see. So very similar to when you start a company, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you are an entrepreneur and you mentioned that you saw a need mm -hmm. and then that is how the organization was structured. So specifically, what was that need that, you know, um, Joanne saw that was needed to be solved? Uh, well, they were with another uh, pet therapy organization and they saw dogs being, um, passing the therapy dog evaluation mm -hmm. who they felt were not enjoying the interactions with oh. people. Okay. So maybe the dog did perfect on the obedience part, but when they really were watching the dogs, they saw these dogs, they were petrified and they were stressed. They didn't like meeting strangers. They mm -hmm. wanted to be dogs. They wanted to be home with their owners and, and in a safe environment. And they saw these dogs being placed in facilities and they felt that it was just an accident waiting to happen, that it was very dangerous. That they were stressed. Right, and when a dog, you know, everyone says my dog can't bite, but mm. every single dog can bite if put in the right environment and situation. Right. So they don't want to pass dogs that don't enjoy it. That's not fair to a, fair to a dog to force mm -hmm. them to do something they don't enjoy. Um, so it makes it safe for both human and dog if everyone is enjoying the interaction. 
So the particular um, need that you were solving or your organization was solving was not only to care about the individuals that these pets were visiting, but also to care about the pets. Exactly. Bingo. Okay, yes. that is absolutely beautiful. Um, because actually when I was training Chewy with you under your organization, um, I remember that I had, in, I, I'm going to call it a chaperone, I don't know if that's how you mentor. call it, a mentor. mentor. Um, we had to visit a nursing home. Mm -hmm. And then when we were, um, you know, walking through the nursing home, the very first thing that she said to me is, let him be. He needed to do his thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was important for her to actually see him do his thing and not that he was so overpowered by me or by my commands mm -hmm. that she could see that he was okay, that he wasn't under stress, um, and that he was going to be able to do what he needed to do without feeling like he wasn't on his place. And then after that, uh, one of the things that we started noticing was that he was actually comfortable, <laughs> that he was doing his job. And then we went from room to room and he was actually walking and he would look into the room and like wait and then look into the next room and wait. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, he's, he's almost like he's working. <laughs> yes. He knows it. And it's, I couldn't believe do. it. Yes. yes. They know. Yeah. They know. And when um, the owner gets the bandana or the vest out, the dogs get all excited because they know it's time to go to work yes. and they and they love it yeah. and we want to keep it that way so we want the dog to always have a good experience yeah. and when the dog gets tired the owner needs to be paying attention to remove the dog because yeah. if the dog gets too tired and doesn't have a good experience it's possible the dog could burn out mm -hmm. and we don't want that to happen yeah so why don't you tell me about the effort that you have to put into you know the work because just like an entrepreneur, that they have to come up with their marketing plan, they have mm -hmm. to come up with their sales plan. You also have to do all of that. Yes. We have to have a marketing plan. We need word of mouth. We need exposure. Yeah. Uh, we need outreach into the community. We have to have a fundraising plan. We have to know ahead for the next year, how are we going to operate and continue to serve the community and receive funds at the same time? So we do um, some grant writing, we do um, two big fundraisers a year. We also um, have like an end of year appeal and individual donations come in and we do corporate sponsorships. So it's, it's always a struggle to make sure that we are devoting enough time to our programs and to the clients and to the volunteers at the same time, keeping working on bringing in funds mm -hmm. to keep it going and it, it costs approximately five hundred dollars to recruit a volunteer and that's incorporating like marketing um, staff time to go find the volunteers and to get them through orientation and through the therapy dog evaluation that is our cost because we also um, ensure we pay for a million dollar liability mm -hmm. coverage for each and every volunteer Wow. So that's our expense, you know, about 500 just to get them up to that point. So that's where the funds go is to, is to make sure that they're covered by insurance, it's to make sure that we can provide the T-shirt and the bandanas, um, that we can provide certification to the facilities. And then we have a volunteer coordinator whose job it is to make sure that all of the vaccines are up to date and keep the insurance and paperwork up to date with all the facilities. So there's lots going on behind the scenes. Incredible. And if anything, I would say that it's a lot more difficult for a nonprofit than, I than, think so. than for an, an organization that is actually getting the money. If yeah. my exhaustion is any indication, <laughs> I would say yes. Wow, incredible. Well, because you want to keep everyone happy. You yeah. need to keep your employees going because they need to be out doing things for the volunteers. You need to be constantly recruiting volunteers mm -hmm. and keeping your volunteers happy and recognized and appreciated. Yeah, so there's yeah. a lot to do. Yeah, But there is a lot of, um, I would say, from the heart compensation. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember, and I'm getting goosebumps right now, um, when there was the shooting down here in, in Florida, and, and obviously it's a very sad story, but 
all of us that went down there, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just the fact that we were there and mm-hmm. that we were able just to be there for the parents and be there for the students and the, um, the teachers and in the community yeah. um, and, and the appreciation that we received back for bringing the dogs, mm-hmm. um, you know, the kids were hogging the dogs oh, and the yeah. dogs knew um, what they were there for. Mm-hmm. Um, and those are moments that are priceless. You yes. know, is there is no paycheck. There is no salary that would ever pay for that. The volunteers were very dedicated, passionate about helping as much as they could, helping the Parkland community start the healing process and helping the students get back to school. Um, And a lot of students told us the only reason they came back on that first day when everyone came back to school was because they knew therapy dogs would be waiting for them. And I mean, probably at least 10 different students said that, that they would not have come back. And we've had parents say that their child was coming home telling horror stories and and having nightmares and talking about the next funeral that they had to attend. Mm -hmm. And when the therapy dogs were dispersed throughout the school, the parents said, it's so nice because now my daughter comes home talking about, oh, you should have seen Chewy today and you should have seen Ripley and they were so cute instead of the negative. Mm -hmm. And she said, just hearing my daughter talk about the therapy dogs instead of the trauma is helping everyone start to heal. Yeah, yeah. And one of our therapy dogs <laughs> is a pig. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And her name is Patches. Oh, Patches. And her sister Lulu is a three-legged greyhound oh, rescued uh, from racing. I think it's more than obvious <laughs> in this case, uh, but I still want to ask you the question, you know, why are you doing this? And, and I would like to hear in your own words. Okay. Well, I never went to college thinking I would come out of college and work for a nonprofit. Um, and it's certainly not any, didn't even know about therapy dog organizations back um, when I was in college. But I did have a career in the for-profit world um, and I did have a career in um, higher education and other nonprofits. And I was perfectly happy at my job at the time, about six years ago. And I heard about canine assisted therapy and I thought, wait a minute, this sounds like something very rewarding. So I checked into it and they actually had a a job opening um, and I didn't even care what it was. I just wanted to be with that company, um, with the organization. So I started as the volunteer coordinator and I've been there almost six years. Um, and held all the positions actually. Grant writer, program development (laughs) person, support person, resource development, and now I'm the executive director. And I've seen over the years how it has really helped so many people. And you don't do this for the money. Mm -hmm. I mean, my paycheck would make most people laugh, but that's okay because I come home at the end of the day and I know that some wonderful things have happened out in the community. All right, so now um, let's pretend that these two mics are um, entrepreneurs or people that are looking at potentially creating nonprofit organizations in the future. So what would you tell them? What would be your advice to them? For starting a nonprofit? For starting a nonprofit or an entrepreneur. Okay. Um, My advice would be to figure out what it is that you're most passionate about. Um, For me, my two big passions in life are animals and reading. I worked for a literacy coalition and now I work for an animal organization. So you have to identify where your passion lies and then it won't feel like work it'll feel fun and engaging and you work at it little by little and you go through the process of say becoming a nonprofit and filing the paperwork and then it is the world is your oyster at that point wherever you want to take the organization and there's a lot of good resources out there to help um, especially like nonprofits there's um, SCORE 
and uh, small business development centers, things like that can also help uh, entrepreneurs. And I would definitely recommend uh, speaking with them and getting help because they're very good resources. Beautiful. Well, thank you very much. If somebody wants to get a hold of Cat or want uh, their dog to become a therapy dog, where can they find you? They can find us on the internet. Um, our webpage is www.catdogs.org. Uh, our office number is 954-990-5175. They can give us a call. Um, and also uh, send us an email at info at catdogs.org and we'd be happy to give you more information. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank that you was so a much. pleasure having you here. I enjoy talking dogs, you can tell. <laughs> we love talking dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and we love Chewy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Now we would love to hear from you. Tell us on the comments below. Was this advice helpful to you today? And how can you put some of what you learn into practice right away to start to see a difference in your entrepreneurial journey? Also, don't forget, if you found this podcast helpful, make sure to subscribe, share with your friends, and hit the like button so we know to make more podcasts like this one.